Good morning, Quia Delta. My name is Ryan Gates, and I'm the Vice President of Population Health here at Quia Delta Healthcare District. Today is November, Friday the 13th, and this is our 28th employee huddle. Our goal is that these huddles will keep you informed and up to date on the rapidly changing policies and procedures around the COVID-19 crisis and the hospital and the district in general. I don't know about you, but uh, Thanksgiving is certainly one of my favorite times of the year. Um, it seems to usher in beautiful weather, um, the holiday season, and in its very name, Thanksgiving, it really draws us into an attitude and spirit of, of reflection and Thanksgiving. I think that despite all that's going on in the world, I'm, a, I, I'm hopeful that you all find time with your friends and family to reflect on all that we do indeed still have a lot to be thankful for. So um, with that, happy Thanksgiving um, coming up soon. Um, just know that we are here uh, to answer the questions that have been submitted throughout the week and we'll also be watching our chat line as questions come in live uh, on this webinar and try to respond to your questions or comments um, you have during the live meeting. The, the recording of this webinar um, will be posted in the employee portal later this evening as it, as it always is. Today we are joined by J.R. Garcia and Carla Hernandez and they are going to be talking about the new Foundation Employee Campaign. We'll also be welcoming Diane Cox, our VP of Human Resources and Jack Bath our VP of Rehab and Post-Acute Services. I'm going to turn it over now to Deborah Volson, our Director of Community Engagement, uh, to moderate our huddle. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having us today. Thank you. Wonderful. So take it away. Tell us about the new employee campaign. Okay. Well, let me um, say that I reached out to JR um, back at the beginning of October. JR has been one of our great supporters of the employee giving program and um, so I thought it was time for the fall newsletter and JR had been giving like for 13 plus years and so I reached out to him and said would you talk to us about how you feel about the employee giving program and um, I'll let JR go on. And from JR there. has a magnetic personality. Of course, <laughs> yes. So welcome JR. Thank you for having me today. And uh, it's it's a season of giving and caring, and so we got to think about others besides ourselves sometimes. And with Foundation, when they reached out to me and asked me uh, if I could maybe even double what I was donating, and I, I will tell you that I donated a dollar for the last 13 years, and I thought about my donation, is it making a difference? Any donation makes a difference. But in my heart, I thought, either go big or go home. And so I joined the hourly club, and I, I donate an hour of my pay wage, every paycheck, back to Foundation. And why is that important? It's important because Foundation doesn't only take care of themselves, you know, for uh, our organization, but they also supply medical equipment that's de definitely needed in different departments. Um, just this year alone, they've, they've donated ED critical care monitors. They've also donated 35 uh, mini grants to help with um, various medical equipment throughout the organization. The Breast Center got a biopsy uh, monitor. It's one of the most advanced ones. It's the Stealth, Stealth Station S8. Uh, I'm sorry, that was for the neurosurgery. They got the Stealth Station uh, S8. Um, Breast Center did get the biopsy machine and some equipment for mammograms. Uh, NICU got 25 giraffe uh, baby warmers, which is amazing because we all love babies. Mm -hmm. And this year we are working with uh, Rehab to get the um, SafeGate 360, which is a track that goes along the roof and helps uh, during rehab for patients to walk. Um, it's best that, you know, we think about others in this time of giving and the time of th being thankful for what we have. And uh, I came in with Foundation today, and I'm asking everybody, and I'm challenging you, either to double your Foundation uh, donation or even go the extra mile or think big and go home. Uh, give that hourly wage if you can. Uh, a little helps, and it goes a long way. And all we're asking is for a little help. What you give goes back not just to your organization, but it helps out your community. If you, yeah. So basically the step up campaign is we are just asking employees to step up their current yes, donations. Yes. And so how would an employee do that? So it's uh, easy. You can go to, I have the Korea Delta Foundation. It's foundation at kdhcd.org. Um, and there's a link on the foundation page that uh, a tab for employee giving they click that there's a little button that says uh, employee donation they click that and just fill that out if you're giving a dollar and you want to give five dollars two dollars whatever just put in your new amount it'll update to us and we'll contact you to follow up 
So we have a an extremely successful employee giving program. Yes, we do. Do you guys know the percentage of employees that are currently giving? Um, it is probably about 48% now. So out of approximately 5,000 employees within the district, uh, we have about 2,300. So yeah, That's we amazing. are very healthy. And I do want to give a thanks to all the employees out there that have continued to give and uh, support the vision. Mm -hmm. So I understand if an employee gives at least five dollars, they get something. What do they get? Yes, so they get a very nice hot and cold canteen that says we give and um, they could pick that up from the foundation if they sign up for five dollars or more or we deliver it right to the department. Okay. And you make it easy. It comes right out of our paycheck. Yes. So basically it's just getting into the habit that first time or two yes. and then it's just something you do. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, fabulous. So, any final words? Sometimes it's just one Starbucks you can give up, or maybe just, you know, just a little something to say, you know, thank you. But a little goes a long way. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you Thanks both for having us. us. And if you have any questions about the foundation, of course, you can reach out to Carla, and or you can just email the foundation. Yes. Mm -hmm. we to, I think it's foundation at kdhcd.org yes, yes. and that goes right yes. to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well okay. thank you guys so thank much. You. Thanks for having us. Thank us you. A little time. Welcome. Good morning. 28th. This is our 28th huddle, Diane. Yeah, Jag and I were just comparing notes outside. Today is um, Friday the 13th and eight months ago today was Friday the 13th and I think that was the day that we admitted our first patient. Oh. Yeah, it was the day I remember. It was, we were in the blue room kind of making our final plans on how to handle COVID patients. By so Unified announced that day that they would be shutting down and everyone kind of thought this is going to happen for the next, you know, three to four weeks. Things can get back to normal. And here we are eight right. months eight later. Eight months later. So right. it is definitely it a milestone. Is, it is crazy. Gary and I were talking yesterday about the community calls. We thought we would do these for a few weeks and then everything would just get back to normal. Yeah. But you guys have been a part of the front line You've been at the command center. You guys have been. I. It was funny, Jack. I, I. We did say this. I think one of the first times that we brought you on. I think you and Ryan did a huddle for us, and it was how many weeks after you became a vice president? One week. One week. We literally, I think, officially we were in our in our capacities for about a week. So you were um, probably like, "Yay! Yeah. Oh no, what have I done? What have I done?" Exactly. So you've been um, thrown into the fire, but you've both done a wonderful job, and so we. Um, as an employee, we look to our executive team, and, and I've said this a couple of times in these meetings, I don't panic if you guys aren't panicking. So you, you do a very good job of leading this organization, and we are very appreciative of the time that you give to these huddles. So let's jump into the questions. Um, Diane, so the visitor policy, it, it's, it's a continually changing thing. I know we have teams that are constantly working on it, but one of the things that isn't changing is people are still having babies. And so an employee wanted to know if the visitor policy has lightened up any in the mother baby unit because she has a grandchild that's getting ready to be born. And so um, what is the visitor policy for mother baby? That is a great question for Jag to help with. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Diana, we're talking and then you know, unfortunately not, um, is, is the short answer. And again, you know, from the very beginning, um, you know, we've opened up and we've looked at strategically what makes sense. Um, and really we allow one support person, which is typically the husband or a significant other um, or a spouse um, in the mother baby unit. And at this point, even though the uh, patients um, and especially staff are being screened, they can be asymptomatic and we just think the risk is too high um, to allow additional visitors over so the time being it really is just with one visitor who's typically the significant other or the spouse um, of the mother and uh, you know and we continue to look at it as the county opens up and if the numbers are headed in the right direction we definitely want to open it up yeah. um, so is really the hope does the unique visitor apply to mother baby like could a different visitor come in on okay it's the same only? yep only okay. one visitor uh, can go in and out uh, as they like but it is the one unique visitor okay so diane um can you respond about directors recently receiving bonuses during this time when employees are not receiving their performance evaluation percentages yep i sure can um so 
Annually, the board of Cahuilla Delta, the five elected board um, members, approve common goals for our vice presidents and our directors. It provides us some focus on what is important to the board for us to work on during the year. These uh, goals were approved and are approved in July of every year, so for this last year, July of 19, um, for fiscal year 20, which is um, 7-1-2019 to 6 2020 So they approved them in July for fiscal year 2020. Um, the goals are tied to our strategic initiatives, um, health outcomes or quality, patient experience, the ideal work environment, and of course our financials as well. Um, so uh, the board honored the accomplishment of uh, what, we, what we did accomplish. We didn't accomplish all of our goals. Um, obviously we didn't accomplish the financial goal and some others. Um, but they did honor the accomplishment of the pre-established goals for fiscal year 2020. Um, and um, they also honored all the merit increases that employees received for fiscal year 2020. So same time period, we were doing merit increases and we were working on our goals for that year. Um, the payout of that bonus was in October. It happens after the year closes, the financials are in, everything, you know, everything is reconciled. So, um, but it was for what was received was for the prior fiscal year. For this fiscal year we're in now, fiscal year 2021 that started July 1, there are no bonus opportunities. We eliminated those before the board even uh, weighed in on the budget. The executive team eliminated any bonus opportunities for this year, knowing that um, if we can't provide a merit increase to our employees, which are the most important, we certainly can't afford us ourselves a, any kind of a bonus opportunity. We still have goals in place. The board approved the goals and we're still working just as diligently and hard on them as um, ever, um, but um, there will be no bonus opportunity paid out in October of 2021 for this fiscal year. Um, so last thing we wanted to do was take away merit increases um, for this fiscal year and I'm still hopeful, uh, maybe too hopeful, that our financials will turn and we'll be able to do something, give something back to okay. the employees. Thank you. So we have a chat. Have we looked into allowing family members um, that go with cath lab patients to wait in the waiting room instead of in their vehicles? You know, I'll have to get back. My understanding is I know we're starting to allow them for surgical patients, and it's kind of a similar process where they come in with a patient, they're in the pre-op area, uh, they're in the visitor area initially, and then pre-op they go with um, the patient and then once they go back to surgery, then they do go back. They can either wait in the waiting room or they can go back to the car. Um, but the cath lab, I thought we were running the, we were doing the same process and if we're not, we can definitely look into it. Okay, thank yeah. you. We'll follow up on that. Okay, so Jag, when can we expect to open outpatient lab draws at Cahuilla Delta? Um, again, um, I was working with Randy on, on this um, piece um, when I took the responsibility of lab and kind of under, want to understand the history as well. So even if um, it's not, it, people think it's COVID related, I think COVID um, caused the lab to close earlier than we wanted to. Um, but the plan was um, there's construction that happened to bring the lab to the first floor of the Mineral King Wing, just really right behind, directly behind the emergency room. That was um, planned for a long time. We wanted to get out from the basement it made no sense for you know uh, our own um, employees and patients to go down the basement to get labs drawn but because of some of the setbacks in the emergency room construction that was given up for fast track mm -hmm. that area was um, so at this point the plan is probably mid year of next year when ERs slated to open construction should be done by March we're thinking by the summertime state approves everything and we're in there functioning and then lab will come upstairs um, at that point. Now I will tell you that there are, folks aren't aware that there is a lab station right across the street from the hospital uh, in the plaza building uh, right next to the parking structure and again um, I think hours are 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. they are closed I think 1 to 2 um, they're open through lunch um, and we've expanded that 
um, location because it was it was extremely small place where you would get your lab drawn. So I know Randy's worked with the team to expand that. I think we have a couple of folks that are drawing there. Uh, and then obviously we have the imaging center as well where, again, folks, great parking there. Folks can get out there and get their lobs drawn. But at this point, the plan is not to open up in the basement, really to open up once ER is in their new space, and then it will be nice and convenient. Um, the lab will be on the first floor. Yeah, I really like the second part of the question. Can we at least open this up to employees? Yeah. We like to kind of <laughs> think we could run over and get something special. So thank you. Um, Diane, District Daily. Are we going to bring it back, or are we totally moving with Quia Compass? Yeah, um, I I don't think, I, although I don't know 100%, I don't think we're going to bring back the district daily. Um, whoever submitted these questions um, highlighted uh, a lot of the pros of the district daily. It pushed out to our employees. They didn't have to go search for it. Um, easy to see anniversaries and, and birth dates and things like that. Um, it's not quite as easy yet on the Compass. The Compass is pretty busy um, right now, but there's a lot of functionality in the Compass that we've not yet tapped into, um, including, I think, being able to push it out to phones, mobile. There's a mobile piece to it, I think. Um, so we're, we're, let us, give us time, give us time to continue to uh, design, push out the functionality, um, and really, really get it going. Um, I, I know I, I miss the district daily too, but um, I was able to, not being very technologically competent, but I was able to drag the icon down into my bar on my computer, so I just have to click on it every day. So it's it's right there for me to be able to access it and go into all of the mod modules and things like that. So if you can drag it, if you have a computer, you can drag it down to the bar. It, it's helpful. Uh, that's probably not the right words to use, Daniel, but, you know, that's my non-techie, yeah. you know, drag it down. Okay. Yeah, but, you know, Diane, let's remind everybody that you have a committee, like a Kawea Compass committee, mm -hmm. that reviews yeah. all of the feedback, and, and you're welcome to send in feedback because, you know, when an employee tells you of something that's not functioning properly, your team works on that to yeah. make sure that you change that. Yeah. So um, we appreciate the feedback on the Kawea Compass. Just give us time. Yeah, yeah. It's just a new a new habit to get into. Yeah. So Jack, since you're funneling over uh, people to the lab draw at Willow Plaza, are have you guys increased the staffing there to be able to handle it? We have. Um, <laughs> we used to make it work with one, one phlebotomist, so there are two there now. Uh, so we have increased staffing. There's one registrar there, and it's working out fine from that standpoint. Um, but just the sheer capacity of the waiting room, we've had to expand uh, one. You know, one reason obviously being just social distancing wise, but then just the sheer volume as well. And when I talked to Randy, I want to say, you know, before we were maybe seeing 20 to 25 draws and now it's doubled in capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not uncommon for us to do 50 to 60 per day okay. at that location. Okay. So let's talk about the, um, the testing at rural clinics. So we, we've received quite a few comments about um, the weight the COVID hotline. Some people, we, Gary and I talked about this yesterday in the community webinar. Some people are on the phone upwards of an hour. Mm -hmm. And so what, what's going on with the testing? You know, and again, um, we, we missed the mark um, a bit on that. I don't think we anticipated the volume that we expected to have. Um, and I, it's a sheer volume um, that's making us reevaluate the need for additional staffing. So I know Ryan and Jessica are looking at increasing staffing. And, and again, we just didn't expect the sheer volume that we're getting. Um, but we've recognized that and there's an active plan um, to address that. Now, the other nice thing is that the urgent care centers, both locations, Court Street and Demery, are going to be up and um, alive on Monday. Uh, which is nice, uh, and obviously VMC, but we're seeing upticks everywhere. Um, VMC is, again, trying to strategize and make changes in the moment because people didn't have to get scheduled, and but the waits are getting such a lot longer, even if you physically go there, um, that they're trying to figure out what, what's a good way to make that initial contact and then schedule them to come in for the testing piece of it. Again, it's just such an unknown, um, and we're just trying to make adjustments you know, as we recognize as soon as people bring it to our attention. So I really appreciate even our own staff giving us feedback because if we don't get the feedback, we assume things are fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have the last couple of weeks, I know they've diligently been working on plans 
to uh, increase staffing is, is really what it comes down to. Right, and something really interesting. So um, I think maybe this feedback, I had some community feedback come in on Wednesday as well about the long waits. And then our team responded back to me, um, it was Veterans Day and the county was closed. It's true. You know, so it, it was really congested that day because of you mm -hmm. know other areas being able to close and we didn't. So that was, that was very interesting. So Diane, we're kind of seeing a slight uptick in employee positive numbers. Um, are, how many do we have on quarantine right now? Are you concerned? Yeah, so um, I'll take you back 14 days to October 30th uh, when we had around 20 employees who were, ha were out positive COVID. Fast forward this two weeks and um, we have double the amount of employees that are now out. Um, so. I would say it's a bit more than a slight uptick. Um, we're starting to see two, three, four employees a day come into employee health that are positive now. Um, I can only assume based on the history since March that it's following a holiday, uh, which was Halloween. Um, and probably people got together and didn't wear masks and physically distance and so here we are experiencing that uptick. Um, so am I concerned? I am concerned, um, especially since we're going into Thanksgiving and then going into Christmas and New Year's, all events where families will get together um, and may not do it safely uh, because it's cold outside and they wanna be inside. Um, so I heard on the news this morning some of the states are really encouraging their, um, their people to cancel Thanksgiving. Uh, that's a heavy hit. I know people are tired of this, um, but I am worried. I'm worried about our employees getting sick. We have flu in our environment now in our, in our counties. Um, I'm worried about families getting sick and parents and grandparents. Um, I mean, mostly I'm worried about people getting sick, but you know, um, we're going into a tough staffing season too if our community members get sick and start to come in. Um, we might see a surge again in December and January and we're all gonna have to take a deep breath and, and prepare ourselves for that. So um, I was gonna you know, say at the end, happy Thanksgiving to everyone, hunker down. Um, we do wanna get through these holidays happy and healthy uh, to the extent that we can. So, Did I get a chat on that? Well, you got a chat, but it was somebody just saying, people should not be out at Black Friday. See, Black Friday is my favorite day of the year. <laughs> so I'm like, I have to go out. I'm just going to mask. I'll put the, you know, you just never know what's going to be canceled. But thank you for that comment. <laughs> and thank you for, um, Diane, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but what is, what's the number, the most employees we've ever had out at one time on quarantine? Uh, it was almost 100. It was okay. about 97 at any given time. And, and then it got down to like... 20, 20. 21 was okay. our lowest. And I'm, and I'm worried we could get back up there. I really am. Um, we're going to continue to see positives as a, as a, from the, from the Halloween um, parties and then we're gonna go right into Thanksgiving. We are gonna see an increase, um, and I am really worried about it. Okay, so while we're kind of on this topic, um, and both of you can chime in on this, so what is the current process for t contract tracing within the hospital? So two coworkers were treat treated a patient on Tuesday. They were not told that the patient was being tested for COVID. So on Wednesday, they found out through the chart that that patient then tested positive. So should they have been notified that that patient was being tested? Yeah, yeah, I don't know the timing. So when a patient is, I, I need uh, infection prevention to help answer this. When a patient is positive, then there's the contact tracing that occurs between infection prevention and employee health. And I don't know if, I don't know what the circumstances are with this situation that um, they, these employees, employer employees found out through the chart versus found out through the, the appropriate channels. Um, so when I find out, I'll, I'll uh, send the answer in for the, for the, what, what you guys post. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll back, we'll follow back with that. Um, they should have been contacted. I just don't know the timing of it. 
how fast after an, a patient is positive do the employees get contacted? Okay. I know behind the scenes the work to take behind the scenes the work takes a bit of time. That's what I was going to say. I mean, tracing is more complicated than people think. Um, but I know Sean and his team are very engaged and involved and work hand-in-hand -hand with employee health, right. making sure that everyone's notified. Mm -hmm. It just, yeah, it takes a bit of time. Well, and I think the question would be, should people on the floors be notified if a patient's even being tested versus yeah. notified after the fact you know, I don't know. I don't know if something yeah, comes you know, within the chart. I would say intuitively, yes. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the patient may be tested at 5.30 p.m. and then the staff are going off duty at 6.30 right. and the timing of it and getting that communication out. I, I don't, yes, they should, but I don't know what the timing is on this, in this situation. Okay. So we've got to check it out and, and get back to you okay. on it. So do we, does Cuida Delta work with the Vice, city of Visalia or the county, and do, do they listen to our recommendations in regards to being safe out in the community? We have a great relationship with the county. Um, I know Ryan, Carrie, Gary, even James, um, you know, are usually talking to the county on a weekly basis. Um, usually we're on the same page. Um, you know, we want people to be practice, you know, uh, all the safety that's coming along with COVID um, and messaging. I know we've worked on together as well. So, you know, and I would say compared to other counties, um, as Gary sits on, you know, forums throughout the state, I can tell you that the relationship that we have with our county compared to other healthcare organizations, they're kind of practicing in silos. So in that sense, we work hand in hand. And I think messaging, we, we could never do enough messaging is the way I feel about it. Um, but I usually, you know, we work together on getting that message out to the community. And our marketing and social media teams yep. have done phenomenal work in terms of pushing messages out. Um, I see them on social media, and I, I think now it's time probably to do that, to kind of heighten that again, mm -hmm. that those messaging about safe practices. And it's figuring out how to put those messages yeah. out without being bossy, because then when we're bossy, it encourages it can, rebellion. It can, no, no, you're exactly it can right. come back. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing, you know, I think you know, we've been in this for eight months. People are tired. Um, you know, and it's exhausting and you know, limiting who you're seeing and wearing a mask all the time. People are just tired. And and I think it's been a bit frustrating. Um, you know, again, I think folks have seen other counties moving forward and we haven't. Um, but again, we all just need to understand that we're all in this together. Um, you know, it just can't be certain sectors that are, you know, going along with things and other folks aren't. It's got to be a team effort. Right. So um, let's talk about the vaccine. So do you have any idea when the vaccine is going to be released and the likelihood of us getting it here at Cuya Delta? Great question. I would say that has probably been the hottest topic um, last week, even at our section chief meeting and in general in the country. Um, you know, earlier this week, Pfizer announced um, how far along they've come with their study and how effective it is. They're saying it's 90% effective. Um, I will say, you know, the whole vaccine process to me at the federal level so far has been handled. They've been trying to stay ahead. Um, so again, the short answer is we don't know exactly when we're going to get it. Um, but I will tell you that our leaders had a meeting with the state yesterday. They're on a conference call together. California has developed a tier system uh, on who's going to get it first. Um, I would be shocked if healthcare workers aren't in tier one. Um, and then a few weeks ago, the state reached out to us and wanted to know, again, how we would, within our organization, who would get it first. So I know Carrie and our medical technical team got together and identified, you know, areas like obviously Two South where we take the COVID. Um, positive patients or emergency room, those areas are being prioritized within the organization. And again, as soon as it's released, healthcare workers are going to be a priority. And so what we're hearing now is that they're in their close to their finishing their phase. They're working on FDA emergency approval for the Pfizer product. Um, folks are hoping to get that, you know, pushed through by the end of November. Um, Pfizer is saying hey, we're going to have 50 million doses available. Again, it's two doses, so that'll be enough for 25 million before the end of the year. I don't know how many healthcare workers or front, you know, first responders we have in the country, but again, that's 25 million that becomes available before the end of the year. 
Um, this morning I was reading uh, Pfizer's, they're hoping to have 1.3 billion uh, available next calendar year. So again, they have very aggressive plans and you have three other major players that are also developing you know, their vaccines uh, and they're not too far behind. And, and again, you know, if you were to ask me, I would say hopefully by the beginning, the first quarter, the beginning of the year that healthcare workers uh, we'll have it available. And the county's been great. You know, they've been trying to plan ahead because we knew two of the vaccines out of the four are going to be required to be frozen. Um, so the county has already um, made sure that we have a refrigerator because they want to make sure healthcare workers um, do have the first option. Again, you know, and I'm hearing negative 80 to all the way to negative 94 degrees is what this is going to have to be stored in. And again, they have great ideas from the federal and state level of how we're going to transport the, the vaccine to these locations as well. So I would say a lot of energy is going into that. Um, again, I want to remind folks that as exciting as it is here to hear that the vaccine is, we're getting close, it doesn't mean we can't, we stop, you know, wearing masks and being diligent. You know, we really want to keep the numbers down. And, you know, we are around the corner at this point of a vaccine being developed. Um, so I would say we're, we're close. Um, so, Jack, I'm sorry. I, I just, I'll just add, I listened into the CHA call this morning from 9 to 10, and um, everything Jag said is, is accurate. Uh, they are going in phase one, it's going to be high, the healthcare workers in the high risk areas. And elderly people in congregate living um, will be, and then people with comorbidities, they'll be the first priority. Um, then the second tier will be health, other healthcare workers, I think. So probably first quarter. I yeah. think they will have some vaccine rolled out in December. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tulare County was on the list of the counties that is a priority this morning on the report. So when you're learning about the vaccine, is it going to be a vaccine that you have to take every year, like the flu vaccine, or is it like mm. a one time, like the chicken pox? Right, so um, Good you're, you're really challenging me, Deborah. So what I've read so far uh, about, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time you know, talking to James and the Pfizer product, and basically, you know, their second generation of, you know, you have your first generation of the vaccine, that's what we're trying to get out and develop. And they're not sure yet because it's a brand new vaccine. So they're trying to determine how long is the impact or the effectiveness of the um, vaccine going to last. You basically have three options. One is we would get it yearly like the flu shot. The second option would be is it would be like a tetanus shot. You would get it, you know, every so many years um, to get kind of a booster. Or well, the third option is like polio. You get it one, you're done. But we don't know. Uh, we just don't know because obviously the first part of the phase was, hey, let's make sure it's safe and it works. Mm -hmm. And now it's going to be like, how long does it last? Right. So those are three options. Either it's going to happen annually or it's going to be, you know, after every few years or it's a one-time shot and you're done. Yeah. And there is a lot of fear uh -huh. about a vaccine that has is being rushed into production. Mm -hmm. And we were... We were making fun of Gary yesterday because it was said in a meeting that <laughs> we're going to give it to Gary first and we're all going to sit back and watch him for like a week. Right. Make sure, and he said yesterday, make sure I don't grow a horn or something <laughs> like that. But no, it is. And our employees, they're saying, they're asking, is it going to be mandatory? Yeah, so just like the flu vaccine isn't mandatory, um, the, this, when it's, this is rolled out, it, it, it won't be uh, mandatory. We can't, we can't do that. Um, uh, so, but, you know, just like the flu vaccine, if you don't um, have it, then you're required to wear the mask ex at all times on campus except when you're eating. Um, so that would be a, a requirement. I'm certain that's going to be the requirement mm -hmm. if you don't get the COVID vaccine or even if you do. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be 100% effective, so I think masks are going to be required anyway. So, because um, right now or before, say last year, BC, uh -huh. before COVID, if you declined the flu shot, you had to wear a mask Correct. from a certain month mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. another time. Yep. Okay, but with COVID, we've learned this year that it's year round. Uh -huh. So they might have You'll, to, you know, we're yep. gonna be wearing, I feel like we're gonna be wearing masks. For a long time. Definitely. Yep, yep, for a long time. Okay, so some departments are starting in-person meetings without social distancing. Is there a protocol for in-person meetings? You know, I think what we've talked about um, in our section chief meetings is it's we definitely want places where we can't create the social distancing, then folks need to be wearing masks. Um, and again, we're trying to still limit the capacity of the room to 50%. So folks are spread out. But even some of our rooms don't allow for, you can be a 50% capacity, but you can be closer 
than six feet together. Um, but just to be con conscious of that. And again, what we're saying is you got to wear a mask if it's going to be closer than six feet. Yeah. And we do have our conference meeting rooms do have um, numbers mm -hmm. attached to them, uh, the capacity. And so I, I believe I've seen somewhere something about in-person meetings. I don't know if maybe Cindy Mosio has that. Uh, but we, I mean, I'm doing my in-person meetings with all of our community ambassadors. We're limiting the attendees. We're making sure um, they are seated at least six feet apart. Mm -hmm. They have to wear masks. So um, I'm sure that's somewhere. I'm sure there's a policy. I thought somewhere. we were still at 25%. Is it 25 or 50? It's 25%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, thought, I, I know there was some discussion at. to consider 50. There maybe. was. Yeah. Okay. I think we're still so at 25. So evidently Rosie sent out conference room information. So um, we can ask Rosie to send that back out to everybody and uh, make sure everybody is on board with that. But they, the department should not be meeting if they cannot practice social distancing. Well, it, the, in person. it may have to occur, uh, but they need to be wearing masks. Okay, okay. Because a couple of weeks ago, we also had the potluck. You know, some departments were doing potluck. Um, starting to bring in potluck food, and I believe that is still against policy, correct? Uh, yeah, we don't want to have a situation where people are ha hanging out over food and breathing on it and, you know, touching the same utensils and things like that. There may be an occasion where some, like in the cafeteria, people are serving the food, right, and there's a barrier. Um, that might be an, a, a possibility. Mm -hmm but definitely not a traditional potluck where there's food spread out and people are touching all the handles and breathing on the food. No, that would be not. Because be besides family gatherings, we have department Christmas parties and holiday things. So, you know, as much as we want to do that, we still have to keep in mind yeah. our social distance. Single wrapped sandwiches <laughs> on Subway. Panera. Exactly. <laughs> they, they do a great the job. box lunch, grab it and, and go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and yes, they're asking for the distance policy link or policy number. We will try to find that and we will send that out. So thank you. Um, okay, so our county <coughs> our county numbers are really high. Um, I think on Tuesday they were 181. On Wednesday they were 131. We know we have to be below 33 for at least three weeks. So we are nowhere near that. But as a hospital employee, I'm constantly watching our hospitalizations which are remaining pretty low. And sometimes that kind of gives me a false sense too, mm -hmm. because I'm like, well, there's still only this many people in the hospital. But if we continue to see the numbers rise in the county, are we going to shut our stuff back down or is that totally dependent on our hospitalization numbers? You know, you know, again, the state can always come out, you know, with new mandates about elective surgery. There's always that risk. But I would say the, the whole sheer purpose of even the first lockdown that, you know, basically everything was locked down really was to preserve capacity for hospitals. So we've learned a lot in the last eight months. And, and to me, it, it really comes down to is how's our hospital capacity and we might have to internally make those decisions if that if those numbers continue to go up so I, I do think it's based a little bit more on can we handle operations and manage the COVID positive patients is going to be the bigger driver behind it like I said locally internally that's what we're going to look at but again the state or the federal government can come and, and come with a new mandate that we would have to follow um, but I would say that again it's it, not anyone's best interest to go to where we were back in March. Right. I think if we, that's why it's being encouraged now, hey, we know the numbers are going up, let's really be smart about it to really control this before it gets out of hand. Uh, and we are starting to see, I would say, you know, again, locally, even though our numbers are going up, you look at the Midwest and some of these locations, I mean, you know, El Paso, Texas, um, you know, they, they, are, they are having their surges and we just don't want to be there again. These in, things would get shut down. Yeah, in the news, um, they were talking about hospitals that are having their COVID positive employees that are asymptomatic work in the COVID units. Um, they're so desperate for employees. They're so desperate for staff that they're actually COVID positive people are working in the hospitals. Now, how they get them in and out of the hospital and I don't know how they logistically do that, but they're really struggling in some of these other states now. Okay, so so who makes the decision? Does the state make the decision, like about our um, 
surgeries, do they make that decision on the positivity number or on our hospitalization numbers? Do you know that? No, I, I, don't, I don't think it's that prescriptive of, you know, I really think, you know, initially CDPH is who we worked with, especially on the elective surgery side, especially when we, when we, you know, when we anticipated a surge and there wasn't a surge and we had a surge later, we really worked hand in hand. So I think it's really working with the local, mm -hmm. you know, government, which is, you know, Tulare County or CDPH, and kind of working through them and saying, okay, this is what our numbers are looking like. We think we can handle it. Um, there was really, again, there was some general information. And to me, they always say it's recommendations. Nothing is mandatory. It's more of a recommendation. So, and we'll follow the, we'll again work with local government on those pieces. Mm -hmm kind of interesting how you can see it kind of moving across the United States yeah. and um, somebody I think it was my mother called me this morning and she said did you on the news it said that New York was going into another shutdown mm -hmm. and so now we're seeing it kind of roll across the Midwest and that's kind of creepy right. to watch that happen so do either of you have an update what is the color we have to be in for lifestyles to reopen red yep right? so we have so to be the next phase we the have next phase yeah and again um, their recommendation is uh, we'd be able to open if we were in the red tier, uh, which is right after purple, but to 20% capacity. But again, the nice thing is the footprint of the Lifestyle Center is so big. And when we opened up last time, you know, there, you're going to have uh, folks that are going to run back to the gym and you're going to have folks that, are, again, and rightfully so, they're going to be fearful, and you know we've I've talked to Patrick about options. If we had an influx, we maybe might have to go to some sort of appointment, you know, workout to make sure. But we want to try to accommodate as many people as we can within those limitations. Yeah. You don't know how hard it's been for me. I have in-person meetings over there, and I really just want to run up there oh. and do the stomach crunch machine. Yep, Deborah, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm like the same way. I'm like, can I sneak up there, you know, once in a while? So. Right. Right. Well, thank you both so much. We have answered all of the questions and the chats. So I'm going to let you close this out with, um, oh, we've got another one. Since we already went through our initial surge, can we consider mm -hmm. doing another round of antibody testing? The antibody was so surprising yeah. when we did it. Um, a few months ago because so few of our employees had them. Yeah, we, so, yeah, the, so the question is, is could we, could we, would we see more now? Um, I don't know, that's something we can talk about. Uh -huh. Do we have a large supply of them? We have, we, have a, a, we have enough supply for antibody testing, that's for sure. Yeah. We okay. do. Huh. Okay, well, yep. that's a good question and a good discussion yep. to have. So. Yep. Well, if you don't mind, I'd oh, like to yes. put a plug in yes. for a few things happening in the human resources world <laughs> that affect everyone. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone for completing the mat. Uh, the mandatory annual training online and net learning. We, you know, we have 5,100 employees, and uh, w at, at the deadline on November 9th, just this last Monday, uh, we we had only 45 employees who were non-compliant. Um, so we need 100 percent, but um, that's really good. And so I want to thank everybody for their compliance and their accountability. And I'm going to now put a plug in that the deadline for the harassment training module in net learning is coming up November 30th, I think. Um, that is a state, California state requirement that every employee have one hour of training uh, for, for, on harassment. Not just Cuya Delta, all employers. So uh, it's, it's critical that, y that everyone finish that module as well. So while you're in the computer completing your modules, please make sure you go in and enroll in your benefits. So benefits are changing quite a bit this year with regard to the health plans. We have a point of service plan, which is a blend of our a current EPO and PPO, and we have a new high deductible health plan. And making the choice on which plan that you want to go in is going to be confusing. Um, it'll, it's going to be confusing the first time you hear it, and maybe the second time you hear it, by the third or the fourth time, it starts to make sense and you start to think about what, I'm, what kind of healthcare services do I think I'm going to need next year and what plan makes sense for me. Um, and so uh, there's huddles that are videotaped on Compass under Working Here. You go into Compass, you go into Working Here, it says Benefits, Open Enrollment Fair, click on that. All the brain sharks are there, there's like 18 of them, one on every single benefit we offer from home and auto insurance, pet insurance, dental vision. 
We just contracted with a new company to help employees with their or their parents' Social Security or Medicare. Um, so use that service. That went live November 1st. Um, but health is going to be the biggest challenge. So reach out, to watch the huddles, do the brain sharks, but reach out to someone in Human Resources at 2274 for a personal meeting if you need that. Um, and describe generally what your health care is going to look like next year, and they'll kind of help you um, understand which plan might be more beneficial to you and give you some other tips um, about that. So um, we have booklets available. Can you see that on the screen? We have booklets available. Um, we have, this is also on the compass under that benefits fair. Please take the time this year to make the right decision. Um, there is a deadline uh, right now of November 20th to get enrolled. Um, if you do not affirmatively enroll, if you do not enroll, then you will be in the high deductible health plan and no other benefits other than PTO. It means you wouldn't have health or dental or vision or life or long-term disability or critical illness or the new hospital indemnity program. Uh, I'll put a plug in for that one really quick. That's new starting January 1. If you're admitted at a hospital, it's a $1,500 cash payment to you. So there's no pre-existing. So if, uh, if there's a female out there who's pregnant, is going to have a baby next year, um, and you plan on an overnight stay, as most do, please enroll in that program because you're going to get a $1,500 check. Um, if you know you're going to have a surgery next year, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, pay attention to that benefit. We have already had about 1,400 people enroll, and many, many, many have signed up for that hospital indemnity program. So spread the word. It's a great new benefit that we're offering. And uh, more on the 401k. Um, we're offering a Roth this year, which is or next year, starting January 1 which is a, instead of a pre-tax contribution to your retirement, it's a post-tax contribution. But you're assuming that taxes now will be less, pay them now, because when you want to withdraw that money, the taxes would be higher in 20, 30 years. Um, so um, we're adding that Roth this year. So more to come on that as well. It's all in the book. It's all in the book. Do you have to go through Lincoln to do the Roth, or is that an option? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's going to be, um, I don't know if there's a quick enroll card that we're going to do, if you have to go into the website mm -hmm. or meet with Bob. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Um, and Diane, I'll put in a little plug to <coughs> the HR team that has been doing the huddles. They've scheduled an additional huddle for Tuesday, next Tuesday at noon. So um, if you have not already seen one of the huddles, you need to watch it. Jeannie Bourne does a great job. Linda Hansen and Carmen. They're all on there and the team really is just sitting there waiting to answer. They're there to help you and um, even Daniel and I, we have set in on three of those and we always have questions. Is it starting so to make sense? It is. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. And, and plus yeah. you can you can do your um, enrollment with your current pay stub and so you kind of know what right. you did and you can kind of see it that yeah. way. Yeah. Actually, when you do the enrollment, it tells you, I'm paying this now, this is what I will be paying. Mm -hmm. So it actually, mm -hmm. as you go along, it, it yeah. does it does yeah. that. Sometimes yeah. it's just difficult to remember what you did last year. Yeah. It, it's not. there. Yes. It's mm -hmm. there, though. You see it when yeah. you enroll. So. Yeah, it's a very easy yeah. process. It's just figuring out which way to go. Yeah. Okay, we have a question about lifestyles. Are the members still going to be charged the yearly assessment fee? Um. You know, I think it's based on their anniversary date. So when they come back, depending on when, when they initially joined, it'll be, it'll be due at that point. So it's not like, so it's been closed for this nine or 10 months. We're not charging anybody the annual fee for that. But when their anniversary does fall, we will be charging it at that point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you both. Um, Hey, what are we going to do for the next huddle? Because it will be... Oh, the day after Thanksgiving. Yeah. So we can either Maybe do it Wednesday? next week or, well, the day before Thanksgiving? Or next week? Yeah. Let's talk let's about talk. that. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't want to go a month without another yeah. huddle. So, yeah. so let's figure we out, will, a, we'll figure figure out, out a schedule. We'll announce it. Okay. So um, I'm going to let you guys close with some words of inspiration. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I mean, from my perspective, again, I think people will follow different paths during the pandemic, but we all need to work as a team. I mean, we're kind of in the home stretch and just want people, especially when you're going to the holidays and cold weather, continue to wear masks, 
um, practice you know good hygiene skills just everything that you know that keeps this um, virus away is really what the message I want to get out to everyone in the community and it's hard um, you know I have a son that's coming home from college but again you know they get tested weekly and he will test before he comes home um, so I just think we all need to just you know be on high alert um, during the holidays yeah and I just want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving um, even though it's going to be different again um, a year from now, we can all get together and get together as families and, and, and put this, you know, a, a little bit behind us. Life will be different a year from now. Um, so um, take a deep breath as we get through the next few months. Um, and it's, it is, it's the home stretch. So if we can just take a deep breath and continue with uh, what we're doing now and keeping our numbers low, we'll get into the red, we'll get our vaccines and life will start to feel a little more normal yeah. again in 2021. So I just wanna wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Thank you.